All right, everybody. So today we have back on the podcast, Landon from Basement Bodybuilding. How are we doing, man? I'm doing good. How about you, Dave? I'm good. Uh, anybody who's watching this, you can see the lighting in here is terrible. I'm renovating some stuff and I'm in a little, basically like a cupboard, like Harry Potter in here right now. So <laughs> I am uh, making it work. I would say on the contrary, this is the first video I filmed with actual new lighting in this basement instead of $20 LEDs. So there we go. Uh, I think we traded places. <laughs> right, right. So just focus on landing here. So, uh, so man, I mean, you know, it's funny with, uh, with the podcast, we're always kind of chatting with people online and then you realize it's been a while since you actually spoke live. So uh, I know you've had some good gains since the last time we spoke, particularly in the arm development. So you want to tell people about, I, I saw some of your recent videos and the road to 18. You want to tell people what you're doing? Yeah, so I'm on a road to 18 inch arms. That's my top priority right now in training. Uh, arms have always been something I've struggled with, especially with uh, the way I've been trained and probably trained improperly in the past. So to be able to kind of prove to myself that I had more in the tank for actual arm growth uh, and then almost push that to, all right, they're kind of catching up to almost making my arms a strong point on my physique is very intriguing to me. And I think it goes to show how much you are in control of your own training. So yeah. Teen's just a number that sticks out. It's cool. It's jacked. And I would love to hit it. And that's what I'm trying to do. And what's your current body weight? 197.5. That's four days in a row of it. So it's pretty spot on. And that's the heaviest you've been in your life? Yeah, by about six or seven pounds. I've been up to 190. I don't know how much okay. beyond that, though. Yeah, no, I mean, that, and that's one of the things, I mean, sometimes you get some people who are, you know, like they're like a buck 60 or a buck 70, like, hey, I want 18 inch arms. And it's like, look, man, like the biggest thing is going to be pushing your body weight up over time. Um, yeah. Obviously, you know, over like a long, long period of time, you could be the same weight that you were five years ago. And it's a dramatically different look. But just yeah. in general, I mean, most people aren't going to be making huge gains in arm measurements or really anything, I think, unless they're pushing weight up. I mean, even like the whole discussion of recomping, like, yes, recomping is totally possible, but you're not going to go from 150 at like 20 percent to just like a jacked 180 unless there's some fluctuations there. Yeah, well, you're limited to what you have for fat. So I think that's why when people are looking to make drastic gains in just their measurements. This is actually funny because the last uh, episode of 18 inch arms series that I posted up, the main topic of that video was a question I got of a guy recomping. And he said, my forearms have blown up recently I saw that. Uh, because I just started training them, but my arms have stayed at 16, even though I am getting stronger at the majority of my arm lifts. Uh, and I was like, well, to me, that, that kind of sounds like you might be recomping. And I didn't know that, but he replied to that video saying, actually, I am recomping. Mm. So it's kind of funny overall. But yeah, if you want to make like significant gains, I mean, you, you do have to add on, obviously, yeah. body. you just have to build muscle in general. So yeah, and that's a big thing with any any part of the body that's going to hold more fat, like any discrepancy there. So you could say like thigh versus calves, right? Like, are your calves going to get fatter when you bulk up? Like, yes, they are. But compared to your upper thighs, it's going to be, you know, much less. So similarly, like, I would be surprised if somebody was doing like a strong recomp, if they're like, well, you know, the thighs haven't changed, but maybe the calves have grown and everything. Because like, if you're losing fat, your thighs might stay the same size, even if you're gaining muscle, same thing, upper arms, obviously going to hold more fat than your forearms. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And I think part of it, obviously part of it's gaining fat too. Like that's part of the measurement. So that's why it's useful to have your arms relative to arm size. I mean, relative to your body weight, body fat percentage, even the waist in some cases it's useful too. Yeah. Uh, but I think with that said, you have to understand that that's just a process of getting big arms. I've had a handful of people comment, well, what's the point of having big arms if you just have to gain fat with it? And it's like, well, the fat isn't something that you net gain that's just part of the process then you shed it away and the gains stay not all of them but a lot of them especially yeah. if it's productive training so that's actually my next video on a comment i got saying oh wait till you get lean again your pythons shrink back down to worms and i'm like well yeah. there's some truth to it but i think that's a little bit of an overgeneralization yeah yeah it, it can be disheartening though for naturals it's something i've said about you know if not this is not apply to everybody who's enhanced but there is a size of the like to normal people where getting bigger just becomes more of a negative, especially like the fatter they are. So, for example, you take an IFBB Pro, they're shredded 250. 
that person really only looks worse to the general population as they get softer, right? Because now they're just like a big 270. And for a lot of people, they really can't tell the difference between somebody who's just like big and fat versus big and muscular, you know, within, again, normal levels of body fat. Uh, I distinctly remember a guy from my, like growing up, the gym I went to growing up with my dad. And he commented, my father commented about this guy. Oh, yeah, he, he used to be in really good shape. And now he's out of shape. This guy was like a monster, very clearly enhanced, maybe like 14 or 15% body fat, but was no longer like the shredded huge guy. Whereas if you're natural, that's not necessarily the case, right? For a lot of naturals, like being 15% body fat, because you're heavier, and bigger can look better. So go to your comment about like, you know, the pythons becoming worms. It's like, like, this is the heaviest and the fattest I've been in years. And I haven't had so many compliments <laughs> in, in those same many, like number of years. So it's going to be uh, unfortunate in that sense. Yeah. Well, what, so where are you at with your training? You're saying that you're at 15% body fat or so? I'm, I'm above 15%. Yeah. I'm probably, I mean, I would say 17%. Um, yeah. I mean, it depends, obviously, you know, you see some lighting versus other lighting, but I can tell you, I'm actually pulling it up. So um, my arms are tied with the biggest they've ever been. But they are, um, so let's say I'm looking back from 2016. So we're going ways back here, which was the heaviest I'd ever been. That's when I was like about 220. So in this instance, at this particular way, and I was 217, my arms were 17 and a half inches. My arms are currently 17 and a half inches, um, but I'm about 210. So I was like, okay, I mean, that's a pretty significant difference. Now, yeah. waistline wise, um, you're looking at about half an inch less right now they compare to 2016 so it's like okay so same arms half an inch less on my waist six or seven pounds lighter um yep. obviously that's you know that's good but again i mean that was seven years ago so <laughs> um yeah uh, go ahead I, no I was, I was just gonna say at that point that's solid gains and i think a lot of people fail to see that where you'd kind of just look at the measurement and a lot of people will say you can't just look at a specific measurement but like you're saying it's in in comparison to other metrics too that you're using to measure so your body weight where it's like yeah i mean technically you're not on the biggest arms you've ever had but they're the same size as they were when you were when you had more fat and when you were heavier so if things add up correctly you should have at least what you're at now or which you already secured or have bigger arms if you were to get back to 217 and gain seven pounds so just for yeah a couple listeners if we're looking into like ratios and stuff Totally. Yeah. Like, yeah, presumably if I were to keep going up to 217, it would be very surprising if my arms were not then bigger than they used to be. Right. I mean, it's very unlikely I'd get seven pounds and have nothing go to my arms. Right. Yeah. And it's not even necessarily just fat. There's going to be some muscle in there too. So the real question is, are you going to get to 217? Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I don't think so. Um, I don't know if it's like just age or because I've never I've had friends who by the time they were 30, they were like, man, like they, they could really feel that they were older. And I honestly just never really felt that way. I pretty much felt the same. But I will say the last year or two, I don't know if it's my profession, fatigue, I'm not really sure. But I just don't feel as good as either when I was younger or lighter, because this has been a slow bulk. I mean, this has been over two years, basically. So hmm. um just, I mean, they're not like big things, but just certain times I'm like, yeah, like if I were to like run an all out mile right now, I don't think that would be great, <laughs> you know, <laughs> or like uh, just certain things I feel a little more just out of it than I would have before. Mm -hmm. And to, to go up like another like 10 pounds or so, but then other people, I mean, I, one of my friends is like pretty genetically gifted and mm -hmm. his, his legs are like 20 years old, squatting four or five or eight kind of a thing, you know, like yeah. college athlete. And <laughs> we hadn't seen him in a while he's like 250 he's like yeah i don't know just been eating a lot i'm like okay and he said he feels great so you know it depends on the person how old is he now at 250 he is 30 or 31 and he still feels fine and everything so this was like a reason i mean he had been as low as 185 like very lean and then this was like a slow like he's naturally a big guy um yeah he, he told he tells me he feels fine he actually just busted his uh acl with some like, very heavy lifting and uh, actually you know what it was i think I think you might have done it hiking, which you do see sometimes, right? Some guys like they keep pristine form when lifting and then mm -hmm. they're doing some random thing. And uh, I, I knew a guy who tore his bicep. He was moving his couch. Dog jumped on the couch, tore his bicep. So yeah. sometimes it's like these things you're not thinking about. Yeah, it's just random bad luck. It's like you can you can prepare for anything, but if the wrong 
thing happens at the wrong time. Yeah, like the jo the dog jumping on the couch. It's like, ha have you ever trained to have like a quick seventy five pounds? Depending on the dog, yeah, yeah. what you're holding, probably not. A little have brain. you had any serious injuries? No, no, I don't know how I've done it because I went from skateboarder to hockey oh, really? player to lifting hard, and it's like bodybuilding and a fair amount of powerlifting stuff too. I've never had anything worse than just a little nagging injury. I'd say the most painful thing I've ever had would just be like minor little, not minor, but like some forearm splints just from pushing mm -hmm. preacher girls hard uh, to to the point where I actually had to take a deload. Uh, I've like never really had to do that before. And it's not like I'm leaving reps in reserve all the time. Like I've pushed big heavy weights for a lot. I think I'm just, I, I think if, if I have any genetic advantage, it's resistance to injuries and, and nagging pains. Like I, I can run lifts, couple times a week for a while and kind of just be fine. Yeah. Yeah, no, that, that is fortunate. Um, I know a couple of people have talked about the importance of just not getting injured. Um, yeah. I don't think I share that quality when it comes to nagging injuries or like kind of like these like nagging pains and whatnot. Um, but I am fortunate. I've never had any like major tears or anything, even, you know, I snowboarded, I skateboarded sports my whole life. Um, but thankfully yeah. I was able to avoid that. Yeah, the the nagging pains are fine because I think I'm like a patient enough guy and you strike me as the same type of patients uh, where you can just oh, a little nagging pain, deload, get back to it next week. It sucks, but it is what it is. But like tearing a muscle or something like that's just a different beast. I, yeah. I could not imagine something that severe where you're like, oh, you can't train that muscle or even maybe lift it all for like months on end. That's just a nightmare. Yeah, I've, I've had a couple times where I got pretty strong on an incline barbell bench. And I distinctly remember one time where it was like it was getting worse and the next week it was worse. And then the next week it was like rep one and eh, two. OK, really not good. By the time I got to four, I was like, if I do another rep, something is going to tear, which sometimes you don't get the warning at all. So I was lucky I at least yeah. had a warning. Um, and actually, even um, I've only heard a couple of people ever relate to this. I, I'd be interested to hear you or even people listening, like comment below if you've ever seen this. One of the reasons I stopped doing heavy deadlifts, I would get this intense pull on my pec and like kind of like the outer, like Terry's major area, just the mm -hmm. arm going down, mostly if, if I was doing sumo, I mean, an incredibly intense pull where it's like, I cannot do another rep or something is going to tear here. Yeah. Interesting. I've never yeah. heard of that before. I can, I can picture it. Like obviously, it, yeah, it's your upper back kind of holding the weight up, but it's still pulling your shoulder down, especially on a sumo where you're going a little heavier, you're a little more upright. That's just, it's a big weighted stretch. Yeah. yeah I've never, I, never heard of something like that though. Yeah. Even, even more my pec than the lat, the lat a little bit, but the pec, which is where like, yep. I, I don't think anybody has ever torn a pec during a deadlift, but it, it, that's no, really what it first. felt like. It was a yeah. very weird feeling. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, it's a valid excuse not to do heavy deadlifts, right? right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so going back to like the, you know, what we're talking about with like the progress there. So I always say, and it sounds like you're similar where when people compare, you know, I know some, somebody, this was a comment years ago was like, oh, you're going to tell me you couldn't make any progress. And it's like, no, like, look, man, it's not about just gaining weight and strength. I mean, you could bulk to 300 land and you're going to be bigger and stronger, but it doesn't necessarily mean that was the most productive thing to do. Um, now I say either you have to compare to the same body fat and see like that you are, you know, bigger or stronger there. Or uh -huh. if you are the same body weight, you would hopefully then be leaner. So is that kind of like how you're looking at your progress as well? Yeah, certainly. I mean, for me right now, like I'm, I'm still early, early enough in my lifting to where I'm not like maxing out my genetics or I don't have, I don't have to worry about that yet. Like I think mm -hmm. you probably have to, uh, I'm still a little bit earlier. I'm still, I, I recently turned 25. So I still have like kind of is the rest of my 20s to try and push things far and not worry too much about just like staying in a little cut and bulk window or anything. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it all comes down to ratios. Uh, right now, I'm not worried too much for myself personally about ratios because I'm going into kind of uncharted territory. Like I'm stronger than I've ever been on a lot of lifts, bigger than I've ever been in basically all my muscle groups and uh, heavier than I've ever been too. So I just don't have that many points of reference, but I'm basically using this time as uh, it, it's building my baseline for future comparison. So if I don't want to keep doing these big, crazy bulks when I'm late twenties or early thirties or whatever, then I can use this as a baseline and say, all right, well, right now I'm 197.5. 
uh, 20, 21% body fat and my arms are 17.5. So when I get say 18 inch arms at 212, can I get 18 inch arms at 202, 205? Yeah. Uh, basically the same thing that you're kind of using for your comparisons too. It, it, it ultimately it's all ratios and that's how you don't just fall into the trap of doing, doing whatever you can just to get a specific arm measurement. It's, it's the same fallacy as powerlifting where you're like, all right, well, the biggest one at max means I'll be as big as possible. So I'll just get fat and cut my realm and just chase that. So it's all about chasing that, but also using other parameters to kind of keep it in, in check is the way I see it. Yeah. 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 I forgot that you were only 25. So when did you start lifting? I was, I started lifting right before I turned 18. I had okay. to take some time off for hockey. So I got uh, more consistent with lifting at like 18, 18 and a half is kind of when I went like all in on it. And it's been mostly productive training. There's absolutely been times where I went two years making zero progress on my arms because mm -hmm. of things I've talked about on the channel before, but for the most part, it's been pretty much productive. Yeah, that's great, man. Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you've still got plenty of gains ahead of you, which is great. Um, okay. Have you mostly, I mean, I, obviously the title is, is basement bodybuilding, but what are some of like the biggest changes you said that were, let's say, differentiating the unproductive times compared to more recent times? Well, I think it's ultimately when you set a goal, that's where your training gets reverse engineered. So that's why I'm a big uh, advocate for something like measurements. And of course, you have you can't just say measurements and ignore everything else and just get fat and get a huge waist just to get huge arms, like I was saying. Uh, but it, it's a matter of if if I went into that training mindset. So my training when I was power building, for example, kind of a buzzword right now, but I'm not trying to like make it a buzzword or anything. When I was power building, focusing more on the big lifts, my incentive was I will get these lifts as big as I possibly can for my one rep max. And there's no way that I won't be huge from having these huge lifts. Big people are strong, strong people are big. And that's just, that's just what I did. So I was like, all right, I'm going to reverse engineer this. I want this, this, and this for my big three one rep max. And I want this total. I will train and do whatever I can to get those numbers up. I don't care if I have to cut range of motion. I don't care if I have to bulk. I don't care what it takes. I'm just going to get these numbers and I will be satisfied with my physique. That turned out to not be the best way to go about things. Looking back, it's very obvious, but I think back then I was emotionally tied to those goals. It was also a pretty big part of the culture back then, which has shrunken down quite a bit, I'd say, but I'd also say I've just gotten older too. Like I'm not 19, 20, 21 anymore, and I can see things more objectively in a way. Uh, so when I just kind of take that same passion, but shift it towards measurements, when my goal is to get an 18 inch arm, I'm not just going to say, oh, I'll just get a huge bench. And my arms should grow. It incentivizes me to measure my arms and do training that deep down. I know will actually grow my arms. And ultimately I didn't just switch my training from focusing on the big three to just focusing on arms. Arms are probably what I care most about right now, but that same measurement concept and that same growth concept applies to the rest of the muscles that I'm trying to grow to, which is basically everything. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, I, I kind of was late to the game there with the power building, the box. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. The power lifting conversation that was going on, I guess it was that natural hypertrophy had put out a video saying that it was, uh, was an abomination. Right. Yep. And then there's a lot of comments. I, so I didn't make a video on it. I just saw some of the debate on it. Did you have a particular stance there or did you make a video on it? Yeah, well, I've made a few videos on it. And that's honestly, that's what my channel's been about since day one. So for me, that was just stuff that I've kind of been talking about for a while. Okay. Uh, I generally tend to agree with most of what most people have said. I think ultimately the difference is people's definition of what power building is. You have some people saying power building is getting as strong as you can in every muscle which is probably more of like a base strength building, in my opinion. I actually put out a, a video uh, last week going over what each thing actually means, comparing power building to powerlifting to general strength, base strength, hypertrophy, aesthetics, FFMI training, all these different things. There's like eight different general goals that people can have, in my opinion. And I put those out in pretty clear terms just to prevent confusion and get people on the same page. Uh, but yeah, with power building, uh, I would say I agree with most people. 
Uh, there were a few disagreements that I had with uh, Dr. Milo Wolf, and I respect a lot of his views and thoughts quite a bit, but there were a few things that I do think uh, I disagreed with him on. Like he said something about, uh, not something about, he did say that having an objective goal like a, a, a one rep max on a big three will motivate people to grow. And I agree that for some people that can be just what they need to hear. But I think once you get what if you're already motivated to train and you're already going to train hard, that's not necessarily the best thing to focus on because you could just focus on getting bigger instead and people, not people. He said that uh, something like a hack squat, it's hard to get motivated to train a hack squat hard because people aren't comparing their strength on it. Um, and I, I just disagree with that mindset because you're limiting to your, you're limiting yourself to what people have already gotten strong on and, and trained in the past yeah. versus something like a hack squat or a preacher curl from a mechanical perspective there are great lifts for the muscles that you're training same with like a smith jm press those are three lifts that i absolutely love and adore and if i was still stuck in the mindset that i need to just focus on lifts that i can compare to other people and not just lifts that i can get good on myself uh, I think you're limiting yourself quite a bit, especially when the big three lifts aren't all that you need to to train for every goal, especially if you're just trying to focus on general aesthetics and building muscle in your entire body. And especially if you like growing muscles like your shoulders, arms, lats, uh, like the muscles that people actually care to grow for the most part. Right, right. Yeah, from what I saw, I mean, it was an interesting debate. I thought that I mean, at the end of the day, I do think there is more bodybuilding specific training, right? And more and less bodybuilding specific training. But I also think that when I heard NH talk about his, how he kind of viewed power building, it wasn't what I, or how I view power building. So like I came up in, let's say like 2007 and eight, and a lot of the forums, like I've talked about one before iron addicts forum, which has been gone for a while now. And to me, and, and a lot of those people, people, um, power building was more, it wasn't, hey, I'm going to do a powerlifting routine, and then I'm just going to add some volume at the end. Because that's what powerlifters do anyway. I mean, most powerlifters are not literally just doing the big three. Most of them do the big three, but then they have these accessory compounds. And so the way, and again, like I don't want to mischaracterize it because I, I certainly didn't watch all of the videos on it, but it kind of almost sounded like NH was saying power building is powerlifting and then some volume. To me, it was always like power building is still focusing on big compound lifts. And yes, oftentimes the big three, but not necessarily just the big three. And just making sure that you are still getting very strong. It might be that some of these exercises are in the three to five rep range, but then you also have some that are, you know, could be 10 to 12 or 12 to 15 or whatever. Um, and not just this strictly like, hey, isolation, focusing on the burn and pump and like, you know, kind of the classically more bodybuilding training. So I don't think it necessarily has to be this huge dichotomy, but to me, powerlifting or sorry, power building always included still some higher up training, still significant variability in the training uh, and, and wasn't so discordant from bodybuilding goals. Yeah. And that's the, that ultimately that's what the problem is, is. It doesn't have a strict definition because it changes over time. So when someone like you or even someone like Steve Shaw, who has a pretty similar uh, viewpoint to it. I think you guys were kind of, I know, I don't know what year you, was it 2005? You said that's when I started lifting. lifting. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I'm, I'm proud that I remember that I'm impressed by myself. But, <laughs> uh, I would say that's, that's a pretty similar time to when Steve Shaw was mostly talking about, um, those similar training methods or where those training methods started. Uh, I would say when I started lifting, power building had taken on an entirely different definition. And that's why something like power building can mean multiple different things to multiple different people. So I think when someone like NH talked about uh, power building, meaning what, so basically he gave it what my definition, the, the power building that I kind of grew up with, when he talked about it that way, he had some people say, whoa, 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 this is a straw man. Power building isn't this. Power building is getting as strong as you can across multiple different lifts with an emphasis on some compounds and low reps, maybe similar to your definition. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's where some people are like, wait a second. So I agree that what you're saying is an abomination, but I don't think that is power building. So I think you're attacking the wrong thing. Right. And that's, again, the problem with just just the name power, lift, uh, power building. And that's where the semantics actually do 
kind of matter a bit in my opinion because you yeah. can have like i said that same power building that you kind of grew up with and then the same power building that i grew up with and you can say oh well power building is it's a combination of powerlifting and bodybuilding. So you're trying to get as strong as you can on bodybuilding lifts. And then you could say, well, powerbuilding is combining bodybuilding and powerlifting. You're going to focus on the big three and you're going to focus on bodybuilding. So which one is it? And I think that's where the issue comes into play because some variations of power building are much better than others. That's for yeah, sure. Yeah. So, so what was the definition that you grew up with then? So mine would be just straight up combining them as in you're trying to become the best power lifter you can. Mm. So that's the power. So trying to get your one or at max on the squat bench deadlift in your strongest form, the best you can, and then trying to build an aesthetic physique on top of that, or just build as much muscle as you can aside from that. Even then it's a, the building parts blurry because even bodybuilding has multiple different definitions. Like there's training for aesthetics where you're going for a customized look of your choice where Maybe you don't care about legs, but you care about arms, or you can just be training for bodybuilding with a well-rounded physique or just trying to pack on as much size as you can, where you only focus on the muscles that carry the most weight physically, like the quads, chests, back, glutes, that kind of stuff. So I would say in general, it's just trying to become the best power lifter you can while being as big as you possibly can muscle-wise slash looking aesthetic too. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and it's not that it's so different, but I would agree that that's not how I think of power building generally, like, especially with such an emphasis on one rep maxes. I mean, obviously I've done plenty of one arms over my life, but it wasn't the mainstay of my training or the goals at all. Like I thought it was interesting actually earlier when you had said that one of your goals was I'm going to get the highest one rep max. And even, you know, 15 plus years ago, I, I think it was generally recognized that like that is not going to be the best way to gain muscle. Now, I strongly believe that one of the best ways to get uh, to gain muscle is to find key exercises for yourself and get as strong as you can in those over time in the proper rep ranges, right? With good form. That I think is huge. Um, but yeah, the whole like going for your highest one rep max, I would say is clearly pretty flawed if, if your main goal is for physique development. Yeah, well, it, it ultimately comes back to just the yeah, like I said, it's all it all comes back to reverse engineering in some degree, I think, because when you when you say, all right, well, the best way when you when you believe that the best way to get big is the fastest progressive overload possible, that's when the issue comes in. So there was an entire generation of us being kind of force fed that progressive overload is all that matters and lifting heavy is all that matters. So in my mind, logically, when I looked up to these people that would say power building is the, the best and everyone wants to get strong and just everyone around me, everyone on social media is doing the same thing. In my mind, the logic is, all right, well, if I can deadlift 600 pounds, that's going to do more for me in terms of hypertrophic stimulus than any bicep curl ever could uh, because the deadlift is heavy and the bicep curl is light. So I would skip lifts or at least kind of half-ass them, uh, the lifts that were lighter. So any isolation lift, I would just not really train that hard. Uh, any compound lift, I would go all out and the, the heavier the lift was, the harder I would train it because it had more potential for net overload. So for my deadlift, I was like, all right, well, if I can get my deadlift from 385 to 600 plus, then I'll be huge from doing that because progressive overload causes hypertrophy. Since then, I've thought about it quite a bit and I've kind of almost, I almost have the opposite stance now. Not that progressive overload is not important, but progressive overload I see rather than the cause of hypertrophy, it's more of an outcome. So that's why my biceps can grow from something like a preacher curl, even though it's only 100 pounds compared to a 600 pound deadlift. It's giving me st stimulus to my biceps, which lets me overload and progress on that specific movement. So it comes from a very flawed uh, view on how progressive overload works and the role that it plays. And looking back, it's uh, it's incredibly obvious, but when everyone else is kind of saying one thing and everyone around you is kind of saying that same thing too, it's hard to see past that. So I, I had to separate myself a little bit from the fitness industry and really think about it for a while. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there has certainly been some good conversations over recent years about how is it that you're forcing the progressive overload that's causing the growth, or are you providing the stimulus that's causing growth, which then allows you to progressively overload. Um, but I do want to make a clarifying point, I think more for like the audience, although, you know, you feel free to give me your thoughts as well, is it sounds like you're saying, like you're saying, hey, maybe the progressive overload aspect wasn't as important. But I think just to clarify that you're saying, hey, 
getting as strong as possible on compound lifts is not necessarily the most important thing, let's say for like bicep growth, of course. But I would say that you are still focusing on progressive overload. It just might be more it with like the proper exercise and the proper execution and things like that. But ultimately, you're always going to need a quote unquote progressive stimulus to the muscle that you are trying to grow. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So the way I'd say it specifically, and I'm going to try to say it, try and say it as clear as I can. With progressive overload, I do still believe that the stimulus is what allows you to progress. So if I was to do a, a set of preacher curls, say 100 pounds for eight reps, uh, and train that movement hard, and let's say I took it to zero RIR, if I have to progressively overload, then if progressive overload causes growth, then I'm stuck because I'm at zero RAR. There's nothing I can do. But if I got nine reps the next week, I think that would be proof that the set of eight from last week got me enough growth and enough stimulus to be able to do nine reps the next week. So I think that the stimulus you're getting is actually what causes uh, the, the progressive overload to happen. And that's how you can add that extra rep. But with that said, you have to make sure that extra rep happens. And if there's a plus one for the taking, you have to take it. You can't just leave it there because even so maximal work is still going to be difficult. Like my working sets on preachers are 105 pounds. If I do a set with 90, it's still very heavy and it can almost feel, it doesn't, if I did a set of eight with 90 pounds, it doesn't quite feel like RIR. Like I know I have more reps, but it's still very challenging. So if I wasn't to take those progressions when they're there, that's when I'd shoot myself in the foot because it's still challenging, but it's sub maximal work. So that's when it becomes an issue. So you still have to use progressive overload. It's just as a measuring tool and almost some accountability too, in a way, it's just like measuring your muscles to make sure they're growing. If you're, if your lifts aren't progressing, then something's, something's going wrong. You're either not growing or you're not taking progressions that are there, which is, which is a big issue. Yeah. And I think it is a good conversation to be had because for the longest time i meet a lot of people and like i would so i would agree that if somebody takes you know their inclined dumbbell bench from 50 pound dumbbells for 10 to 90 pound dumbbells for 10 like their chest is going to be significantly bigger right and a lot of like the dc guys would talk about this and like from that whole era and it's like yes that is true but just saying like because sometimes they would say stuff like oh well you got all these guys focusing on like pump and fluff stuff in the gym and they need to do like these like heavy lifts and get stronger on those and everything. And it's like, yes, but like just saying get stronger doesn't tell you how you get stronger. Like what's the ideal stimulus to get stronger? And it might be yeah. that like, you know, like Mike Israel would argue, hey, this bodybuilding specific training is allowing me to grow the muscle optimally to be able to do that. To yeah. your point, it's like, well, in this example of the preacher curls, 100 pounds for eight reps. And maybe one of these other guys would argue, well, okay, when you go to nine reps, that's going to cause the bicep growth. But to your point, it's like, well, look, if I'm already at zero RAR and I've hit eight, how do I go to nine reps? Like I, the only thing, unless you're cheating, like if you're assuming exact same form, then the only way I can go to that ninth rep is if the stimulus has been there to increase the contractile tissue size, which is then going to allow that ninth rep to go. Right. So spot um, on. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. My point spot on. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it's an interesting way. And like, I think ultimately it, it probably does matter. I mean, even if it doesn't necessarily change how you're training, I mean, it could, because then you, you realize, Hey, it's not just about getting that, that extra rep, because if you cheated, that's not necessarily going to be more stimulus, but if you can mm -hmm. try to emphasize that stimulus, hopefully that allows more growth. And I, and I do think people can, I mean, I'm, I'm big on progressive overload, but I think people can go too far with it where they're just looking at the number and it's like, you know, you got to have that form constant or, you know, where there's a lot of factors that go into making sure you're not just cheating your way there. Yeah, exactly. And then to take that a step further with progressive overload, if progression is what causes growth, if you take that approach, then, okay, well, by nature, lighter lifts are going to have slower progressions, but they're not necessarily less stimulative as, as we just discussed. So am I going to be able to add reps and weight to my pressure curl as often as I am to my sumo deadlift. And if you think something like progressive overload is what drives growth, not something if, if you do think progressive overload drives growth, but you only add a rep every four weeks on preacher curls, 
are you really going to train them that hard? Are they really going to take up that much of your mental focus and your program? Or are you going to bias the lifts slowly over time? It's not it's not a quick decision when you try to do this, but this is something where you start off with a, with a well-rounded program. If you assume progressive overload and each time you add a rep, that's when growth occurs, you're going to put all your eggs into the lifts that progress the most. So the heaviest lifts, because inc incrementally it's easier to progress on. It's not the progression rate doesn't really change, but your ability to see it, because if you can add five pounds to a 600 pound deadlift, that's a tiny little fraction. But when I added five pounds to my preacher curl, it's night and day. Yeah. Yeah. Do you ever use anything like micro plates to try to show that progression? I've actually considered ordering them because, uh, I went up from 100 pounds on preacher curls. I hit eight. I actually, I went to 110. Uh, thinking I would get like five, maybe six, and I got two. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> that's when I was like, okay, maybe it is something I should consider. I went back down to 105. Uh, I got five reps. So that's probably the lowest I'd go reps wise on basically any lift. Preacher curls, I do prefer to go heavy on because it's a grindy lift where you can just get a nice length and bias there. But I think I need to order some 1.25s. And uh, I guess going smaller than 2.5 pound jumps might just be a little bit redundant. Like, I don't know what the actual rep drop off would be from 2.5 pounds heavier from a lift that I just hit my rep goal on. Uh, but I guess time will tell maybe as I get more advanced, then it could be a, a viable option. Yeah. Yeah. I was just in a little bit of math here, um, just to do like an, an estimated max calculator here. So let's see. Yeah. So I'm the same way when I add small amounts of weight where sometimes there was a shocking drop off and I try to make sure my form is the same, but even then, I don't know if that's maybe like an indicator of, you know, slow switch fibers. I mean, that would be an argument whether or not that's accurate or not. But, um, if you were to, you put it into a rep max calculator and whatnot, they would say that hundred for eight is about a 126, 127 max. Whereas 110 for two is only about 117. Obviously you didn't drop 10 pounds off of your one RM. But, right. um, but I, I consistently find that too, where I'm like, wait, I had it five pounds per hand in these dumbbells. And I just went from like 17 to 12 or even like 10 reps or something. It's a pretty big drop. Yeah. I would say part of it's just being, not being trained in, in low reps. Like that, that's a skill that you have to train too. So, yeah. uh, yeah, whether, whether it is like a muscle fiber thing, like your point, or if it's just, well, I've never gone below five reps. So in heavier loads that I've never touched before that are, uh, lower rep wise than I've ever done, then maybe I'm just not trained to be able to handle something like that. Totally. Uh, so we had roughly talked about this a little bit, but you had mentioned in a recent video, and I, I like this, that you don't just focus on, Hey, it's not just about more volume, but it's on exercise selection is a big thing too. And that is something I would give some credit to somebody like Dante Trudeau who talked about that, where it's, um, and even there are like John Meadows has talked about the, the importance of exercise selection, Scott Stevenson, I think, and one of the arguments they will make is, look, if you have 16 inch arms and they've been 16 inch arms and like, do you, and you've been doing 12 sets a week of like, let's say barbell curls is going to 14 sets per week or 16 sets per week. Like, is that going to be the answer? Maybe for some people, but I think finding a proper exercise with maybe a new stimulus, maybe like with some of the newer research, we see like a, a length and biased emphasis, things like that can one, not necessarily add a lot more fatigue to your training, but then two, hit it in a more optimal way. And I, when I have my clients going through like their initial routine, and especially as we adapt it over time, I'm generally not adding tons of volume. Sometimes I am, but a lot of times it's like, let's find some key exercises that work really well for you. Yeah. Yeah. I'm in the same boat. So the volume is definitely, if everything else is in check, then I'll slightly manipulate volume but it's never it would never be volume like back to back in most cases so it's like all right two sets you're stalling out let's go to three and then oh three sets didn't work let's try four like that's mm -hmm. not my that's not my thought process um but exercise selection is going to be key i mean ultimately that's your stimulus and if you have a lift that doesn't really allow for the best force output or there's something that uh, even as simple as the person doesn't enjoy the lift or yeah. it, it doesn't, they don't like quote unquote connect well with it, even though that's not always a valid reason to not do a lift. Sometimes it's an indicator for something that maybe you can't even explain, or you can't even really see, uh, which I, which I don't disregard at all. So usually I would say 
for people looking to keep growing from my personal anecdote, I would say stable lifts that do have a length and bias brought my arms up significantly more than they ever have been brought up before. Um, my arm training hasn't always been optimal. So you have to take that with some form of grain of salt. But even if these lifts basically at the very least, they're probably equal to everything else, or maybe there's a slight benefit. And I, on the more optimistic side, they are kind of a game changer to help break you past pretty significant size plateaus. So something like a preacher curl and a Smith JM press, where there's an opposing force for that I can drop my elbow onto on the preacher bench. And then on a Smith JM press, it's a Smith machine, so it's supported. Uh, and it, again, they're both length and bias, especially the Smith JM, because the form I use, I drop it right to my chin. My elbow ends up right between my wrist and my shoulder. So peak resistance is actually in the triceps most length and position, where most people that do push downs, even if you get a full range of motion, peak resistance is still at 90 degrees. So even when you're in the full stretch up here, there's just less resistance depending on your setup and your technique. So you're training your muscle in ranges of motion with resistance profiles that have never been trained before. And it's showing in some research and I'd say anecdote in a lot of cases that uh, it's actually just more potent for growth. I mean, I, I think there's some truth to it. Yeah, I haven't done the JM Smith. I've done reverse grip Smith bench, which again is like an old school, like kind of like DC exercise. Um, I like it a lot, but the JM seems like it would be good. I'm, I'm actually getting a Smith machine soon, so I might have to add that in. Nice. Yeah, you're building up the home gym, huh? Yes, sir. Yeah, that was one of the things I want to talk to you about. So I I finally bought a like universal trainer. Um, it's got quite a bit. I'll do a whole review on it soon. I, I got the Bowflex adjustable dumbbells that go up to 90 pounds. I did a review on nice. that. Um, I like them. You know, they're, I, I, I mean, obviously my whole video is like 12 minutes on it, but overall, I think it's like a decent buy, but very much looking forward to the universal trainer because I'm, I'm pretty much at the point where I think I'm just going to cancel my gym membership. So I want to have yeah. much everything, everything that I need to go there. Yeah. Well, I mean, the way I see it is like some, I get a lot of questions about the home gym. Like now that I've been training here for coming up on three years, I would say the stuff I use the most, the Smith is incredible. You can just do so much on it. I yeah. live on that thing for presses. Preacher curls are insane. And then a single stack cable tower uh, mm -hmm. is incredible for any cable lifts you want to do, or even like a little lap pull down. They're pretty compact too. And it's like outside of those three things. Yeah. Like an easy bar. If you want a barbell instead of a Smith, you can do that too. I'd say the Smith, uh, is my preferred way to train just extra stability. And I think it's overall, you can, you can do Smith JM presses, which are nice and smooth, a little bit different than a barbell since it's a hybrid lift. So you can do Smith hack squats, just a couple extra variations, but they're valuable for home gyms in my opinion. Yeah. I had a number of people who recommended, I think it's called uh, the prime machine. And I guess that's a pretty high end uh, buddy of mine got like the rogue monster rack, which is huge. But yeah. neither had a Smith. And I know some people hate on the Smith. But I'm like, man, there's a ton you can do with a Smith. And there's some really yeah. strong, really impressive people who use Smith machines. Oh, yeah. And especially there. I don't think that's just a coincidence, too. I think there's something to that where obviously you're you've been lifting for years, like what, 17 or 18 years now. So you're, yeah. you're pretty strong. So there's something where like your stimulus to fatigue will actually matter. And if you're strong and you're benching in the low to mid 300s and you're squatting in the 400s, deadlifting five, 600s, it's like at some point moving those lifts to lifts where you can get more at a less weight or just doing them in the Smith, you save a lot of fatigue that way. Uh, even if your, your weight used isn't all that different, there's something about the stability that I can't explain that just like I, I've been there before where I've trained so hard and I've gone like pretty heavy, especially for my body weight. Um, nothing crazy, but I've been strong enough to where I have to kind of consider stimulus to fatigue in my opinion. And even just doing the same weights on the Smith is just a, a world of difference, but the stimulus isn't any different. It, yeah. If anything, it's a little better. Yeah. And, and I also find just from a timing standpoint, the warmups for me personally are a lot shorter. Um, I distinctly remember at my uh, old university gym and I would do barbell squats and I would have to do like five or six warm up sets. You know, I do the bar and I do like 135. And if I was really tight, I might even do like 95, 135, 185, 225, all the way up to like 315, 365. And 
then I would go and do Smith machine squats. Now you could say, oh, well, that's because you're already warmed up. But there was a couple of times where maybe I had something tweaked or whatever, and I just couldn't do a barbell squat. So I made my first exercise, the Smith squat. And I don't know exactly why, other than just like the stability is different, but I would do one or two warm up sets and I'd be ready to go. And um, same thing with bench. I don't have to do nearly as much warm up. So it's just a faster workout. Yeah, I agree with you too on there. It's funny you say that because I've never even thought about that. But looking into my warm ups now, warm ups aren't something I, I look into a whole ton. I think partially because I'm, like I said earlier, not very injury prone or anything. So it's never something I've had like lingering in the back of my mind, which I don't know. Maybe I'm lucky where I don't have to worry about it, but maybe it will kind of bite me in the back down the road. Uh, but I, I even my Smith bench working sets, I, I make a 75 pound jump from my final warm up to my first working set, and I feel perfectly fine. Uh, and back when I was benching, I'd do like 25 pound increments the whole way, and it would take an hour. Like <laughs> it's, yeah it's a different. yeah wow now you're saying your weights are are actually pretty similar to what you would do for barbell lifts Um, yeah, so I don't squat or deadlift anymore. So there's really no comparison there, uh, for pressing it's roughly the same. Um, I'm actually a little bit stronger on pressing now than I was even at my peak power lifting, power building days. Uh, if I remember correctly, I think the best I ever hit was 300 for two and 290 for five on barbell bench, Uh, I've hit 295 for a few sets of five on Smith bench now, uh, which is, it's nothing crazy stronger, but it, it, it is a little bit stronger. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and the, the thing to look at now is like, well, it's, it's not a perfect one-to-one -one comparison. So back then, what would my Smith bench have been when I was that strong bench press right now? Uh, I don't think I'd be very strong on barbell bench, um, just because the bar path is all out of whack. But yeah, they're overall, I'd say pretty similar strength on pressing, maybe a hair stronger now, generally. Uh, everything else is much stronger now, especially my weaknesses from back then. Like my quads and arms are night and day. I'm like twice as strong now. Not not actually, but if Yeah, yeah. What's it's, your it's a major difference. what's your leg day look like? Because honestly, I've been doing upper at home for a long time now, over a year. Yeah. Um, I don't, you know, that, that's pretty easy to do. But lower, I was like, okay, well, I had the barbell. I mean, I could obviously squat, but I don't love doing heavy squats and deadlifts anymore. The Smith, I think, is going to be great. I actually have two different benches where they have the leg extension and leg curl add-ons to them. They're okay, but clearly not as good as like an actual machine. So what's your leg day look like? Yeah. So my leg day I actually go to the commercial gym. You do. Uh, I don't film it a whole ton, so you won't see a whole ton of leg training on the channel. Hmm. But I go in and for the past seven months, I've been doing two sets of hack squats with a pretty low stance and then two sets of pendulum squats with a moderate stance, both very deep full range of motion. Uh, and then I do some hamstring curls, just a couple sets on the seated ham. And then I'll do two, usually two different lifts for calves. I'll do a standing calf raise for two sets and then one set, maybe two sets on a leg press calf raise. I just find that the, the hip support is pretty nice on that. Sometimes I'll just do one. Sometimes I'll just do the other. And that's mostly just because calves aren't my highest priority and the calf raise machines are always... taken for some reason i don't know why it's not kind of odd you think it'd always be the bench and whatnot but the gym i go to it's the hamstring curl and the calves i'm like all right what are you guys doing here Yeah, like when I go, I'm like, man, I'm kind of just going all the way to this gym for like the leg curl and leg extension machine, which is kind of a waste. So we'll see if I can get something that's like a suitable placement. yeah i would uh it, i guess it all depends home gyms are tough because it's like i know you said you had a fairly high budget for your home gym huh you were looking to make a Yeah. pretty Yeah, I mean, I'm over, I've only spent, let's see, with the rack and the dumbbells, I'm maybe at like 6,000. Um, and I mean, that, I mean, obviously for some people that's going to be a lot, but I mean, the rack itself is like pretty comprehensive. I mean, it's got a lot. So the rack was about five and then the dumbbells, the adjustable dumbbells were 600 and then the rest I kind of just had for a long time. So not even actually six. So, I mean, it's really not like a cost thing i just don't know if i want like the entire area taken up with like all this like like one piece of equipment for this and one piece of equipment for that ideally you get something that's like kind of combined but we'll see Yeah. 
I would say if I could pick one machine or recommend one machine for legs, I would go with the pendulum squat. I don't know if you've used one, no. have used it before. They're, it's like nothing you can ever, hmm. nothing you've ever done before. It's like, it feels like how a leg press should feel in a way. It's really hard to okay. describe. But like leg press feels, they do feel a little bit off because it's a, it's a fixed path, but a pendulum you're moving in an arc oh, yeah, yeah. and the resistance profile is spot on perfect. Uh, and then the foot plate's huge on most of them too. So you can do a low stance, high stance, wider, narrower stance. It just for, it's the perfect amount of quads and glutes. Uh, and of course it does have the back support too. So it's yeah. I think you Mike know, a little bit of loading. Fan, yeah. right? huh? I think Mike Isertel is a pretty big fan of them. Um, I think I've seen him do them before. I don't follow him too, too closely, but I want to say I've seen him do them before. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, it looks interesting. You know what else I've seen a couple of times recently is um, more people talking about a belt squat. I've seen some people on Instagram talk about it. My friend was looking at getting the one from Rogue, which was like $2,300, which I'm like, man, $2,300 <laughs> for like a single piece of equipment yeah. for a single exercise is pretty hard to justify. Um, but actually the brand, I'll, I'll, again, I'll do a whole review on it, but the brand that I'm buying, they have one for like five fifty, dollars And I'm like, Maybe, you know, depending on, you know, how well it works and everything could be interesting. Yeah. Are are you keeping the brand a secret? Um, I will just for now. Yeah. I mean, okay. it's not like it's like some huge reveal or anything, but, yeah. but yeah. So yeah, no, that's fair. Yeah. No, I want to respect that if you're doing a, a video on it and whatnot. Um, yeah, I would say pendulum squats, uh, are that if I had to get one machine for legs, I would, I would get that. Like if I was going to commit to training legs at home, Pendulum mm -hmm. would be the way to go. Obviously, try it first if you're able sure. to. Uh, but I, I have a hard time. Like any any client I've ever had that has a pendulum squat, they're like, "Whoa, this really? is like I've never had someone be like, eh, I don't really like this. It feels a little off. Like it's always just perfect." And I I'm responsible by pendulum the gym. squats. They're they're a newer machine, so you won't see them a whole ton. The gym I go to opened. Uh, four or five years ago so it's they got like relatively new equipment which is super cool um yeah the pendulum squats a, a, a tank the thing's a yeah. beast he's pretty big though so if you're looking to stay compact right 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 cool cool um so one other thing i wanted to ask you about was i uh, I, I only briefly talked to jeff about this because i didn't know too much what was going on but was there like a whole call out with revival fitness i think is the name who yeah. said like straight up he's just not natural yeah yeah so what's the um, backstory there um, well he he definitely has something against like our little niche on youtube which that's fine i mean you, you're not going to be liked by everyone that's yeah. i have no problem with that whether whether it's a valid argument or, or invalid or whatever everyone's entitled to their opinion and i totally respect that uh but yeah he was there was a point in his video where he was it was basically a sneak diss and for anyone that's follows youtube fitness to a moderate degree it's quite obvious it was gvs in my opinion mm -hmm. i can't say that for sure because he never actually name dropped him but he it looked like he was trying to keep it kind of sneaky but then he said like oh and if this guy like if all these guys weren't buddy buddy with him then they would just call him out instantly and said some other things that gave it some more context but it wasn't set in stone but i could say i'm 95 percent sure he was referencing gvs okay. uh, and then i was scrolling through the comments of that video um it, it was part of the whole power building thing if i remember correctly and gotcha. he just blatantly called him out uh in response to a comment so he wasn't just commenting underneath the video like hey this guy's a fake natty but someone mentioned him and he said oh it's like it's obvious he's a fake natty like every everyone would be calling him out if they weren't trying to siphon his clout and if really? they weren't Buddy, buddy with him and stuff and i was like yeah i mean i have no problem with calling people out if there's proof or if it's obvious that they're a fake natty because obviously you don't want we we all know the problem that fake natties can cause especially to newer lifters sure. but for someone like gvs who he has an excellent physique no denying that but it's also very obvious to, to me personally and probably to you too that he's like basically certainly natural. Like I would put a lot of money that he is natural. I think it's pretty obvious just based on how hard he trains and just the way that he looks like he's absolutely jacked, but there's no signs of him being a fake natty aside from being super jacked. Right. So 
I I think it's a it's a bit odd that he went well, to that. I, I don't want fitness, the entire community that. to to yeah, be yeah. me. I think that's not achievable. But yeah, yeah. what are your thoughts? Well, I didn't I don't know Revival Fitness other than when somebody's like mentioned him or something and I got to follow him, but didn't a part of his popularity come through this community kind of bolstering him up a little bit? Yeah, well, GV GVS gave him a shout out like a year or two ago. Hmm. Yeah, there was, was something it was with him on Doucette or something going back and forth. Um, yeah, there um, let me so I think it was 2 years ago. Hmm. Jeff made a video on underrated fitness youtubers in revival oh, yeah 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 uh and he, i think he's recommended him a couple times and then he also called out revival i don't i'm so bad with time frames no, maybe was, six months ago maybe a year ago because he was kind of selling worse, right yeah he kind of sold out or something right? yeah sold out to some little product that was yeah not a good look uh and then oh, i saw that yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> and then he yeah i mean just straight up called him a fake natty which i think i i personally think he i think he's just overcorrected i i think he genuinely does believe jeff's a fake natty but i think the problem is and this is kind of something i was thinking about that i didn't really include in, in any videos and i probably never will i don't care to talk about it in an actual video anymore but you come into the fitness industry kind of naive and you don't really understand the whole pd side of everything right. And then you almost overcorrect from people like Revival, where right. people like that say, no, 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 these guys are all fake natties. The fitness industry is a bunch of BS and it's all fake. And to an extent, I do agree. But when you have actual high achieving naturals, which you develop an eye for just by following people and by just being in the industry and having training experience yourself and hitting certain size and levels, uh, then you can kind of have a pretty good idea of who's natural and who's not. Mm -hmm. um, and I think he's overcorrected without going back to like, okay, I'm holding back. I'm not going to trust anybody. I'm going to focus on myself and do what I know works for now. And I think he's still stuck in that where I've, I've been there before. Uh, but the bigger I got, the more I was like, okay, yeah, I could see maybe this guy that I used to think was a fake natty, like actually is natural. He trains well. He looks natural. His progress has been steady. I've been following him for a couple of years. And I don't think he ever broke out of that. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely, I mean, you see this with a lot of areas of life, right? It's like somebody was cheated on and they're like, you know what? Like all women cheat. They're all it's just, they're the worst. And they, it's like, okay. Yeah. Or maybe some people are just different than other people, right? Yes. There's a lot of really crappy people out there and there's some great people out there. Right. And, and obviously you have an industry that is incentivized to look good. Of course, there's going to be a ton of people on performance enhancing drugs, and there's going to be a ton of people who lie about it all the time. But um, but to then act like, oh, literally everybody who has any incentive for their physique is, is going to be taking something is just kind of ridiculous. Uh, I know Abel has made a point that I agree with him on. He's like, man, some of these people, if they were fake natties, they really would have to be pretty psychopathic, right? Like imagine like a natural hypertrophy was enhanced. Like yeah. you've got to be a, like a true psychopath, right? <laughs> like your whole identity is that, you know? Um, yeah. And then some people you get them were like, I, as much as like we hate, everybody hates on like uh, Michael Hearn. I'd like to think that like in his mind, he's almost just like trolling everybody. I mean, maybe I'm wrong. I don't really follow him that much, but it's just like where it's so ridiculous. It's like, obviously his friends and everything very much know, you know, I would imagine that they're like at a private lunch or something. Maybe they talk about it. I have no idea, but, um, but, I, and, but as far as like, do I think that Jeff is, I, I think also part of it comes from just knowing the person or liking to think, you know, the person. Cause like, obviously like if you just showed me a picture of Jeff, and I didn't know who he was. And you said he's enhanced. I'd be like, yeah, I believe it. Like, I wouldn't doubt that he's enhanced. Like, there's certain people where, because yeah. um, obviously there's plenty of people who are enhanced who don't look like anything. So I wouldn't, I'd be like, yeah, like he looks freaking massive. And like, you could even say this with somebody like, um, like Jeff Albers, where it's like, oh, he, he gained 10 pounds from one season to the next after he was already adva like advanced. And it's like, well, yeah, if you didn't know that that, beca that was because he dieted much better, not because of his offseason actually gaining 10 pounds of muscle, you might think. Like when I first heard about Jeff, this was back like Jeff Alberts. Um, this was somebody showed me 3DMJ. And this was like 2011. And they're like, oh, look at this guy, you know, and he still gained all this progress naturally. And I literally was like, dude, there's no way he gained 10 pounds of muscle. He's probably enhanced. Again, I didn't know 3DMJ at all or what they stand for. But once you get to know the people, again, they would have to be psycho <laughs> to actually like be on something and that's how i feel about jeff it's like look man like he seems like an honest guy to me 
obviously I haven't known him for like a decade. It's not like we're like super close friends that I've known like growing up or anything, but you know, I consider him a friend in the industry at this point. And I, I would be very surprised if, if he was on anything. Um, and the last thing I'll say about that, you, you made a point like other people who are natural are bigger than Jeff. Like Jeff is super impressive, but last time he was on my podcast, I was like, you know, your fat free mass index, not that that is like this perfect, uh, barometer, well, but, it's good. but it's, it's reasonable. And his is like 24, I think 24 and a half, maybe it's not at like the limit. Um, you know, I, I think some people forget that the other people who maybe don't show off their physique as much, but are still really impressive. Like Elaine Norton, for example, Elaine Norton competed at 5'10", 195 on stage. That is ridiculous. Like that is like, I don't even know, 25, 26. Now he obviously gets a lot of fake natty comments too. Um, but I'm just saying like, there's, there's plenty of other people who have been drug tested a lot and who compete in natural federations who are even more impressive. Yeah. I mean, even just following like, yeah, the top natty pros, it's like, it, it's not like Jeff's like Jeff, uh, GVS is like just blowing those guys out of the water. Like it, it's um, not like he can just walk in and win like top natty shows. Like he, I think he'd do well because he's jacked and looks great. But he fits right in with them. And that's what I'm trying to say. It's like even even like character aside, and that's something that Atlas, Atlas Power Shrug talked about in his video, which I think was a, a great, great point, similar to the one you brought up, where even just character aside, just looking objectively at the physique when he's lean and in the offseason, when he's bulked up a bit more, not that he competes. I don't know. I called it an offseason, but you get what I mean. Mm -hmm. It's very similar, very similar to other top natties. There's a clear trend of looking a little bit like softer uh on camera when you're bulked up not like a big round full veiny like ped user when you're bulked up it's a little bit softer and then when you're natural and you have a pump in the right lighting you look insane when you're lean but look kind of small and close which he's also shown multiple times uh in pictures and on his channel and on his instagram too where he's like oh this is the reality when you don't have a pump uh, and i'm like that's it's just no different than any other top natties and it's like I mean, obviously, you've been in the industry for much longer than I have, but you you can probably see that as just as clear as I can, if not even more clear. Uh, and then I would say, yeah, if you're going to take your point and someone like Atlas Power Shrugged, where it's the similar point about character, it's like you look at Jeff and you look at just his personality type, what he talks about, his understanding of training, how hard he trains, how <laughs> surgical he is with his training to an extent. It it, it just it's <laughs> it's almost. I don't want to say there's, it's not like, it's not completely waterproof, but it's a pretty, pretty solid base of, I'd say data that he is natural. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um, but you know, I, I think a lot of times, even, you know, we talk about these incentives to take PEDs. I think there's incentives to have that call out culture, right? I, I mean, yeah. like the, the natty or not fake natty discussion has been a pretty tried and true path to channel growth, right? Like I, mm -hmm. I made a video probably two or three years ago and I said, is, is Greg Doucette like the second coming of Jason Blaha? Because Jason Blaha, <laughs> you know, he he hasn't had much growth in many years, but he got up to 100,000 subscribers largely through talking about performance enhancing drugs and calling out fake naturals, right? And then Greg Doucette took that, you know, times 10. Um, but it, it is a very... <laughs> I don't want to say easy, but pretty clear path <laughs> to popularity when you talk about that. And and what's funny is all of these guys have taken stuff. I mean, isn't isn't Revive Stronger, uh, not Revive, um, Revival Fitness, isn't he enhanced now? Or doesn't he talk about wanting to be enhanced? Somebody was saying that. Um, I don't think so. I, I think he's natural. Uh, he's, he's talking about him taking peptides or something. I don't know. but um, He could be. I don't follow him that closely, but every now and then an interesting video will pop up and I, I just like that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. I like to keep an eye on other people's stuff, but I would say, yeah, I, I think there's a, there's an incentive to stay natural too, because take, take someone like me, for example, where I'm like getting to kind of that late stage intermediate, like getting to pretty impressive size and measurements. And I'm like a, you could say I'm like a B plus a minus for a natural. Mm -hmm. If I was to hop on gear I'm like a D minus now and I have to restart <laughs> right. everything. Right, right. So it's like I've put in seven years of hard work to become like, yeah. not, I'm not delusional. I'm not a top natty, but I'm like a respectable enough natty. Sure. Why would I set myself back so much farther and commit to this whole other world just right. by opening a silly little door? Well, and, and also to be fair, and this isn't like a knock on any natural, but I think that is part of why 
you get some people who really get so committed and hung up as their identity as natural um, mm. because it's like, and again, I'm not trying to like hate on any naturals, but sometimes obviously naturals are less impressive just based on physique, not on like effort or anything like that compared yeah, to enhanced yeah. people, obviously. So if, if you're natural, then even if somebody who's on gear blows you away, a lot of times you can hang on to that I'm natural thing. And that's why, I mean, I've even seen like, I, we could have a whole discussion on, on like, um, you know, why people stay natural and like the real reasons behind it versus what they say and whatnot. But I do think part of it, it becomes an identity and I think it can probably feel better. It, it's almost like, and again, this is going to sound like I'm speaking negatively on it, but it's like, you know, it's like, oh, I'm like the wealthiest person who didn't graduate high school. It's like, well, yeah, like, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> you know, it, it's yeah, just keep, like, keep that asterisk, right? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. And again, obviously, like, there's so many impressive naturals. I'm just saying, like, sometimes I think people's identity can get really tied to it. Um, for me, the, the decision is mostly just health. You know, it's just, I just yeah. would not want to go down like blasting gear until I'm 40. And we've seen so many examples in recent years, of people dying that that's why I think almost everybody should stay natural. Um, yeah. I don't get too much into the morality of it, unless of course you're selling something and lying about it and whatnot. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's an interesting discussion because yeah, you have so many people with so many different stances on it. And there's so many people that just have very flawed opinions on it that I think you can see right through. And they're just people that are very much so biased, um, not to get into everything, but yeah, I would say overall natural, I th obviously your health benefits and you can still get super jacked naturally. It's like, it's the way I see it is if there's naturals that are bigger than you, you still have room to grow. I'm not saying everybody has the same genetic potential, but you can grow for quite a while naturally, much farther than a lot of people think they can. And then once they realize how to train naturally and keep making progress, the progress will keep coming. And obviously it'll be slower, but you're still making progress. You still look great. And I think part of part of lifting, and I know coming from me, it's almost a little bit ironic because people only see my lifting side of my life and my personality. But I would say like even, even something like lifting and, and bodybuilding and being natural isn't, I try not to make that my entire identity too, because- the reason that I lift specifically, and I think the reason why most people li people lift in the first place isn't to be the strongest, most impressive guy in the gym. It's to look great outside of the gym and have that be like a little perk to your life versus mm -hmm. like saying, oh, I'm the gym guy. I'm the big jacked gym guy. So I think there's there's part of that to it where you almost have to like compartmentalize the whole gym piece of it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um yeah, or at least it starts that way. And then obviously we become more obsessed <laughs> over yeah. time. Yeah. Times, and, then, but... and then you're like, all right, well, I want to look jacked when I go out. And then you stop going out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, cool, man. So, so to close up, um, you know, we talked about, you know, your goal right now, obviously the 18 inch arms, but like, like what's the next year look like for you in terms of like the channel, in terms of your growth and whatnot? Yeah. I mean, I'm still, still kind of deciding I've been Doing a couple upgrades, I want I want to make the channel a little bit just higher production quality. Nothing crazy. I'm not going to start like going crazy with editing or scripting videos. I think part of what I like about the channel is I can just be authentic. I'm not tied to making these like super high quality like movie production style videos. I can just kind of come down here and film in my flannel and turn a light on and upload it from there. But I would say just continuing to develop my physique the best that I can get as big as I possibly can while being reasonable with it, of course. Uh, and then just keep doing what I'm doing with the channel. Um, I'm kind of at a point where I'm pretty, I don't want to say complacent, but I would say the bigger the channel gets, the less I care about growing it. Like when mm. I first started and I hit a thousand subscribers, I was like, whoa, I did not think anyone would care about what I have to say. And then it hit 2000. I was like, oh, this is so cool. Uh, but I guess the, the more I grow, the less I check the sub count. Like I'm about to hit 20K and I didn't even know. Yeah, uh, I saw that. So that's, I don't know if you can relate to that, but that's one of those kind of interesting things. Yeah, I have had, you can look at it as positive or negative. I have had pretty much the exact same growth that I, since I started five years ago. It's like very consistent. All of my videos get somewhere between probably on average one to 2,000 views. And then some will get like, you know, five, six, whatever. But um, it's just kind of where I'm at. 
And, and I know because it's like, look, I don't do any sort of call out videos for the most part. I'm not doing anything with like drama for the most part. It's just like conversations with people. And every once in a while, I have a topic that I want to talk about and I make a video on it. I don't like the idea. One of the reasons I never wanted to have a YouTube channel prior to the podcast was I just didn't want to like, I was like, you know what, there's going to be 50 things I want to talk about. And then that's it. Like, I'm not just going to keep putting out content for the sake of content. Mm -hmm. so the podcast is really nice because you can always talk with more people. And then if a yeah. video idea comes up, I do it. So the you could look at it as a negative of, oh, like it hasn't grown any faster. The other side to that is the fact that it has been so consistent for five years is great because you do some, I see people who have 300,000 subscribers and their average video gets still like only like a thousand views. It's like they had a peak and then they dropped off. So yeah. I like that it's like consistent. I still see a lot of the same people comment and like reach out on Instagram and stuff. Um, so it's been cool, man. It's been, it's like been a good experience for me. Yeah, I kind of had the exact same experience too. It's been as soon as I uploaded my first video, a few people found it and it got views. Nothing crazy, but it's been like the exact same growth since I started about two years ago now. So that's funny to hear you're in the same boat. And I, yeah, I did notice the same thing where you have guys that just, they get involved in some drama, their channel blows up and then they have nothing to talk about and their channel becomes boring. Uh, and yeah, when it comes to like video ideas, I find that the video ideas come as I go because I also get... I, I get more experience and I learn more as I go. So it's like my list of video ideas that I've not even gone all the way through yet. Like I keep adding to that list and it almost offsets uh, the ones that I do film. So it's kind of like a continuous thing, which I I planned to end the channel a while ago. Like I didn't plan to really do it forever. But really? yeah, the same thing you said, just have a few videos to talk about. And I was like, I'm just going to do that and then leave it there and I'll be good. I just want to talk about a few things and put it out there. Interesting. Uh, and then- the more questions I got and the more I started learning about lifting and the bigger I got, the more that I obviously learned and the more things I have to say. And even if you look at like my physique from back then to now, it's like, it's very clear that I've learned more just because I've been able to make more progress since then. So it's, it's definitely pretty interesting. That is Especially interesting. Yeah. One of the reasons that I had started it initially, not just the podcast, but like, I was like, okay, so I had training clients who I don't want to just keep saying the same thing over and over. So I'll make a video on this topic. I can send you the video. I'll make a video on this topic. I'll send you the video. Um, yeah. But then obviously it just morphs into a lot more than that. But that's interesting that you just had a clear initial intent to say, all right, this is just a temporary thing. And I'm going to close it down after that. Yeah, no, it's, it's been, I mean, part of it's like, I've just, I've connected with more people too, now that I have a bit of voice out there. So to be able to talk to people that, are much smarter than myself at the time. Not that I'm not the smartest, not that I am the smartest guy or anything now. I'm obviously not, but being able to regularly connect with people that are more experienced or smarter than me or know more than me in the industry has been able to teach me more things and have me ask more questions too and try and answer them and experiment with things. So it's, it's, yeah, it's one of those weird things where it's like, obviously, People say, oh, yeah, when you stop learning, it's when you stop growing. And of course, there's a limited amount of stuff that you can learn, but I'm learning more than I thought I ever would if I was to ask myself if I knew everything, say, five, six years ago. I, yeah, I yeah. thought I knew everything then, and I thought anything else was just a minor detail. Not necessarily the case. Yep, totally, man. All right, well, that's a great place to end it at. Um, where can people find more of your stuff, man? Yeah, uh, Basement Bodybuilding on YouTube and same exact thing for Instagram. And that's the only socials I've got. All right. Good talking. Sweet. Thanks for having me on, Dave.